So today is Resurrection Sunday. He is risen. And today I want to talk about the life of the resurrection in us today. And my goal today is to get why understanding what happened at the resurrection is so important and to live our lives in its power. The first thing I'm going to do is to describe how the resurrection of Jesus was not simply coming back to life, but the start of a new kind of real of humanity and in fact a new kind of reality and this new kind of human has already begun in us and my last point is going to be how we can live out this new identity uh, traditionally in christianity uh, often the resurrection has been given second place to the death of jesus in our understanding um, uh, you know, the resurrection just proves that he really died and, and that he's alive again now. And, uh, uh, but actually, the resurrection is the very foundation of our new existence. And in the, in, the, in the epistles, there's more references to the resurrection of Jesus than his death. Um, John Murray, the theologian, has said that one of the main sources of weakness amongst Christians is a failure to grasp the truth and its implications. So I want today to try and really grasp that. And the first thing I want to do is to read some the scripture we're going to be looking at in John chapter 20 and verse starting at verse the first verse. Now on the first day of the week Mary Magdalene came to the tomb early while it was still dark and saw that the tomb had been taken the stone had been taken away from the tomb. So she ran and went to Simon Peter and the other disciple, the one whom Jesus loved, and said to them, They've taken the Lord out of the tomb, and we do not know where they have laid him. So Peter set out with the other disciple, heading for the tomb. The two were running together, but the other disciple, that's John who's writing this, ran faster than Peter and reached the tomb first. And bending down to look in, he saw the strips of linen cloth lying there, but he did not go in. Then Simon Peter, who'd been following him, arrived and went into the tomb. He saw the strips of linen cloth lying there, and the face cloth which had been around Jesus' head, not lying with the linen cloth, but folded up in a place by itself. Let me ask you, what's the difference between this and Lazarus being raised? Lazarus came out all wrapped up, didn't he? Jesus went through the clothing. He just rose through it, and we're going to talk about this in a minute. Uh, the other disciple who had reached the tomb first also went in and he saw and believed. For as yet he did not understand the scripture that he must rise from the dead. Then the disciples went back to their homes, but Mary stood outside the tomb weeping. And as she wept, she bent down and looked into the tomb and she saw two angels in white, sitting one at the head and one at the feet of where the body of Jesus had lain. They said to a woman, why are you weeping? She replied, they've taken away my Lord and I do not know where they've laid him. Having said this, she turned around and saw Jesus standing there. But she did not know that it was Jesus. Jesus said to her, woman, why are you weeping? Who are you looking for? Thinking him to be the gardener, she said to him, sir, if you've carried him away, tell me where you've laid him and I'll take him. Jesus said to her, Mary, she turned and said in Aramaic, Rabboni, which means teacher. She recognized him from his voice. Jesus said to her, don't keep holding on to me, for I have not yet ascended to the Father. But go to my brothers and tell them, I'm ascending to my Father and your Father, to my God and your God. Mary Magdalene went and announced to the disciples, I have seen the Lord, and that she had said these he had said these things to her. On the evening of that day, the first day of the week, the doors being locked where the disciples were for fear of the Jewish leaders, Jesus came and stood among them and said to them, Peace be with you. When he said this, he showed them his hands and his side. Then the disciples rejoiced when they saw the Lord. So Jesus said to them again, Peace be with you. Just as the Father sent me, so also I send you. 
And after he said this, he breathed out and said, Receive the Holy Spirit. If you forgive anyone's sins, they stand forgiven. If you retain any, they stand retained. Now Thomas, one of the twelve, called the twin, was not with them when Jesus came. So the other disciples told him, We've seen the Lord. But he replied, Unless I see in his hands the scar from the nails and put my finger into the scar from the nails and put my hand into his side, I will never believe it. Eight days later, his disciples were inside again and Thomas was with them. Although the doors were locked, Jesus came and stood among them and said, Peace be with you. Then he said to Thomas, Put your finger here and examine my hands. Stretch your hands and put it into my side. Do not be unbelieving, but believe. Thomas replied, My Lord and my God. Jesus said to him, Have you believed because you've seen? Blessed are those who've not seen and yet believed. Now many other miraculous signs were done by Jesus in the presence of his disciples, which are not written in this book. But these things are written so that you may believe that Jesus is the Christ, the Son of God, and that by believing you may have life in his name. Amen. Amen. So what's, uh, what Jesus could pass through these grave clothes? What else could Jesus pass through from this story? Yes, the locked room. He passed into this locked room. Uh, and so this is, this is quite remarkable. Um, uh, he could, yet he could still touch and eat food because he ate with them. This is quite extraordinary. Um, uh, just one second. Um, <laughs> he could struck and eat, eat food. Um, now, why was he not recognized by Mary Magdalene? Why? Well, I'm going to suggest to you that he was resurrected in the prime of his youth. And uh, we know he was over 30. Somebody said to him, you're not yet 50. And so he probably looked a good deal older than 30. But if you were to meet this guy walking up the street, would you recognize him? Well, you better get used to it because this is what I look like in heaven. <laughs> this is me in the prime of my youth. So, so, you know, we're, going to, we're not going to have wrinkles. We're not going to have the, any signs of aging. We're going to look young in heaven. So just get, get, used, to, <laughs> get used to looking at this guy um, if you want to recognize me. So um, th th this, this was John. Uh, let's see what Paul says about this. What does Paul say about the resurrection? Paul has a very powerful presentation of what the resurrection means in 1 Corinthians 15. And he's been talking about sowing, and a tiny seed is sown, and it's sown into the ground and just disappears in the ground. But what grows up is like a whole plant. And he's using this as an image of resurrection, of our resurrection. As so it is with the resurrection of the dead. What is sown is perishable, but what is raised is imperishable. The first man, Adam, became a living being. The last Adam became a life-giving spirit. The first man is from earth, made of dust. The second man is from heaven. Like the one made of dust, so too are those made of dust. And like the one from heaven, so too those who are of heaven. And just as we have borne the image of the man of dust, let us also bear the image of the man of heaven. These are some of the most extraordinary verses in Scripture because what they're saying is that the new creation is not going to be made of molecules and atoms, the stuff of this world. It's going to be made of the same stuff that Jesus was made from when he rose from the dead. And Jesus was made of spirit. Jesus was actually raised by the power of the Holy Spirit and we will actually partake in the Holy Spirit in our new bodies. They'll be made of this new stuff, this new, this new um, stuff that can walk through walls yet can still eat food, that doesn't perish, 
that will live forever, this new kind of stuff that we can tell what it's going to be like because that's what Jesus was like. And of course, not limited by, he could move from one place to another, just not limited by the normal limitations of humanity. And now I want to just put this in a table, I think, because I think this is so powerful and we have to get this. There are two creations. The old creation, first entity was Adam. The, the stuff he was made from was dust, which, is, which means like physical, physicality, um, atoms, molecules, the stuff you, this universe is made from and is perishable. The new creation, the first born was Christ, made from the spirit, spirit of God and imperishable. And that is, uh, that is, that is dramatic, that is extraordinary. And uh, one of the most dramatic descriptions of the resurrection is in Colossians chapter 1. We read, and he is the head of the body, the church. He is the beginning, the firstborn from the dead, that in everything he might, have, might be preeminent. What is dramatic about that? It says that Jesus is the firstborn. He's the firstborn of the new creation. He's the first one into this new creation, and we, are get, we, are, we follow him in the same kind of being. We will be the same kind of being as him. He was the first of this new humanity, not just a, a, new, a new race of, of beings, but a different kind of stuff that he was made from, and we will partake in this stuff. So, this is key to understanding. Um, resurrection doesn't just mean coming back to life like Lazarus did and kind of living on. There's something new. There's something transcendent about that. But that, So that was my first point. My second is that, um, the, the, that the, this new kind of human has already begun in us. This new kind of human has already begun in us. This new kind of human made of imperishable uh, stuff is there. And um, we need to live out this new identity in our lives. And I'll talk about that in a minute. It turns out that for us, the new creation happens in two phases. It begins the moment we are saved. That's when it begins. But we don't get part two which is the new bodies, until Jesus returns. Part one, we get the moment we're saved and it's in, in us, within us. It's, it's a, a new spirit within us. Part two we get when he returns. And there's an overlap when we are living in the old world, but we are part of the new. And the new and the old are overlapping and this is where all our problems come from, because if we were immediately into the new, then we wouldn't have any problems. But we're still living in the old, yet the new has begun within us. Um, this is not what um, the believers in the time of Jesus were expecting. They were expecting the Messiah to come and suddenly everything was to become new. <clears throat> and that would be the new age. But actually this time is the time of gospel. This time is the time of the opportunity to bring people in. And so when the final judgment comes, that we've had this period of proclamation of the good news. So uh, what I want to focus on now is this idea of us having this new humanity within us. That we are born of the Spirit now. And um, in John chapter 3, you know the verse as well, that which is born of the flesh is flesh, and that which of the born of the spirit is spirit. This is what the new birth is. And if you're not a Christian, if you're not a follower of Jesus this morning, then this is the opportunity to enter into this. Jesus said, Ask and you receive. Come to him and say, I want this new life. I want to receive the, this immortal new spirit 
uh, I need you to do this, and he will give it to you freely if you trust him. And so from now on, I'm going to be addressing people who are followers of Jesus. But if you're not, you can start following him right now. You can pray to him. You can say, I want, I want to give everything else up for you, God, because I believe you and I trust you. And he will give you this new life. Um, so that which is born of the flesh is flesh. That which is born of the spirit is spirit, describing this new life within us. And then in 1 John 4, we read an incredibly powerful verse. We read, Beloved, let us love one another, for love is from God, and whoever loves has been born of God and knows God. This is one of the most extraordinary verses in Scripture because what it's saying is that we are actually, if we're Christians, we're actually born of God. Now, one of the pictures in, this, in the scriptures is adoption, and that's, that's a good picture, but this is beyond adoption. This is actually really genuinely being his children. Like, we actually, he's actually our father. We have his DNA, because he's saying, if you're loving, actually that love is flowing out of who you are, who you've inherited from your new father. You're born of God and knows God, and part of you is actually a literal child of God. This is quite extraordinary. Galatians 5 says something also powerful. For the desires of the flesh are against the spirit, and the desires of the spirit are against the flesh. For these are opposed to one another from keep you from doing the things you want to do. What is that saying? That there's a spirit within us, a new spirit, but the old is still there. Although we are born of God, the, the vestiges of the old and all the old habits are there still. And so there's this, this war within us, um, part of the old part of us trying to keep us from living in our new reality. So this is who we are then. In the, we are, we're part of the resurrection. We have some of it now. We get all of it when Jesus returns and we have a new body. But in this in-between time, we are... Uh, living with the life of God within us, <clears throat> but then also some of the old stuff that is within us. <clears throat> so this is, takes me to my final point. <clears throat> We've talked about the resurrection of Jesus not being simply coming back to life, but the start of a new kind of humanity, a new reality. We've talked about this has already begun in us, and now I want to deal with how we can live out this new identity, what this looks like, the life of the Spirit in us right now, in us today. So uh, we talked, I talked about um, uh, the verse in 1 John 4, whoever loves has been born of God and knows God, and Galatians 5 about this battle going on within us, and the resurrection of life of Jesus is not simply coming back to life. <clears throat> so uh, this is how Paul describes it. The, the spirit and the flesh pulling different ways. And we need to live out this new identity. <clears throat> so so uh, in, let's, uh, let me just... Uh, move on to, to Colossians chapter 3, because I think this puts it really, really well. And this is going to be one of the, the most important verses that we look at today. Uh, if then you've been raised with Christ, seek the things that are above, where Christ is seated at the right hand of God. Set your minds on things that are above, not on things that are on earth. For you have died and your life is hidden with Christ in God. When Christ, who is your life, appears, then you also will appear with him in glory. Put to death, therefore, what is earthly in you. <clears throat> so this perfectly describes the tension that we have. We've got these old urges we have to put to death and privilege the new life. And I'm going to read now one of the most encouraging verses that speaks to this issue. And it's Paul's prayer at the beginning of Ephesians, praying that 
what actually, that we will actually enter in to this new resurrection life. Ephesians 1, having the ears, the eyes of your heart enlightened, that you may know what is the hope which he has called you, what are the riches of his glorious inheritance in the saints, and what is the immeasurable greatness of his power toward us who believe, according to the working of his great might, that he worked in Christ when he raised him from the dead and seated him at his right hand in the heavenly places. <clears throat> so look at the first line in verse 18. Having the eyes of your heart enlightened, that you may know. This is my goal for you this morning. My goal is that we actually have to know this in order to benefit from it. If we don't know it, we can live in the old patterns. But my goal this morning is that we will, we will be enlightened. We will understand the power that we have. We'll understand what is available to us. <coughs> it's like somebody living in a house and they don't know about electricity. And they're lighting candles everywhere to, to be lit. And they see these funny switches on the wall. They don't know what they are. And they don't, they don't know the, about touching them. And somebody shows them they can switch them on. Oh, I understand. I've got this light. And Paul is saying, you need to understand what you have in there so you can live out of it. And if you're enlightened, you can live out of this new power. Paul is preaching my message for me today in these verses. You don't have to live in the old way. You can live in this new way. Part of our problem is that we're not aware of what we have well, you might, you might turn to me and you say, well, Andrew, this is all very abstract. <clears throat> How do I actually get in touch with this new life in me? Well, there's a simple way of discerning the origin of any thought that comes in you. I'm going to tell you right now, if any thought comes up in you, there's a simple way. Does it come from love? Does this thought come from love? So an urge inside to love others is an urge from your new creation life or a feeling of being loved is a, an urge from this paul puts this beautifully in colossians chapter 3 where he is describing what it means to live from this new creation life and these are verses later on in the passage that we just read just now from colossians Put on then, as God's chosen ones, holy and beloved, compassionate hearts, kindness, humility, meekness, and patience. Now, those are all things that flow out of love, aren't they? He's saying, just encourage those to grow in your hearts, bearing with one another, if anyone has a complaint against another, forgiving each other, as the Lord has forgiven you, so you also must forgive. So if these these thoughts well up in you, oh, I should do this. Notice those. Those are thoughts from your new creation life. And the main takeaway I want you to have from my message today is to notice, to be attentive to this new life within you, to encourage what is new, that it will grow, and to put to death what is old. And Paul is telling us, giving us some descriptions of what this new looks like. Above all these things, put on love, which binds everything together in perfect harmony. And let the peace of Christ rule in your hearts, to which indeed you are called in one body, and be thankful. So <clears throat> the first three verses I've read there are about loving to others, but verse 15 is about receiving it. And if we, this new creation life will feel peace, because it will feel bathed, in the love of Jesus. And so when we sense that we're loved by God, we sense this, we sense he cares for us, this is a feeling that comes from the new creation life that is within us. So what does this mean in practice? Well, I'm going to give you a little test now. You can tell me if a thought comes up inside you, whether you think this is a thought from your new creation life or a thought from the, from the flesh, from the old flesh. Um, nobody loves you. New or old? Old, okay. I'm a loser. Old. 
Of course I make mistakes because I'm human, but God loves me anyway. I'm secure. You. I'm fundamentally broken. Old. Because the old is fundamentally broken, but the new is not. No, it's not. If I was really a Christian, I wouldn't have these bad thoughts. That's old. Yes. That person is annoying me, but let me pray for them right now. New. Yeah. So, um, uh, as, as often happens, God decides to give me an illustration as I'm preparing the sermon. And uh, last, late last night, um, I was just praying over this and uh, I thought, what does the voice of God say to me right now? And I just felt, felt God saying, Andrew, you're very tired. Get some rest. Don't be a perfectionist with the sermon. Trust God. <laughs> was that coming from the new or the old? It was coming from the new. Um, don't overanalyze. Don't th think, oh, you know, I had this, this thought. It's nearly April. I should get my taxes done. Don't analyze is that from the new or the old. You should get your taxes done. Like, it's just a thought. Okay. It's not, it doesn't have like ethical implications, uh, except if you get a thought, uh, you should cheat on your tax. That is not from God. But what I'm giving you now is I want you to be attentive to your thoughts and notice whether your thoughts are coming from the spirit of love within you. And that is the marker of whether it is new creation or whether it's not the spirit of love. Maybe it's self-condemnation or condemning others. And that is the old. And you, I want you to be attentive to doing that. And I want you to really just feel the, the, uh, the presence of God in that. So uh, I'd like to uh, just to read these verses now and uh, just I'd like actually us to say these verses together. If you're okay, you don't have to say it, but if you're okay with saying it, I'd like you to join in with me and we'll read these verses together. And these, these verses you're speaking into yourself as new creation verses. <clears throat> I am a new creation in Christ. I want to experience more of the immeasurable greatness of his power toward us who believe according to the working of his great might that he worked in Christ when he raised him from the dead and seated him at his right hand. And I'm just going to ask our worship team to come up now because we're about to be to be uh, going into some song. It's no longer I who live, but Christ lives in me. And the life I now live in the flesh, I live by faith in the Son of God. And then the last verse. I know how to be brought low. And I know how to abound in any and every circumstance. I have learned the secret of facing plenty and hunger, abundance and need. I can do all things through him who strengthens me. The verse on the front of our church folders. And let's say this again, shall we? Strongly. I can do all things through him who strengthens me. And before I close in prayer, I'd like us to sing a song together, a cappella. You may not know it. It's an old song, but it's basically this verse is put to music. Galatians 2.20. It's no longer I that live Stand up. But Christ that liveth in me. It's, it's no longer I that liveth, liveth but Christ that liveth in me. He lives, he lives, Jesus is alive in me. It's no longer I that liveth. But Christ that liveth in me. Let's pray, shall we? Lord, we praise you that it's no longer we that live, but you who live in us. Lord, may this be our experience. May we live out the new creation life, the resurrection life, in this coming day, this week, 
this year and until we see you returning in glory and get a new body. Lord, we pray that your power be in us now. In Jesus' name, amen.